Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I am your host, Isaac Longworth, and today we're going to be talking about Saint Fidelis. Now, I don't know if you've heard of Saint Fidelis. I actually had never heard about him in my life until uh, a couple weeks ago. I read about him in the breviary. Now, if you're not sure what the breviary is, uh, the breviary is a collection of prayers taken from scripture, other prayers of the church, that as a seminarian studying to become a priest, I am required to pray the breviary uh, a certain amount of times every single day. Now, in the breviary, sometimes they highlight certain saints, they feature them. And so one of the saints being featured that day was Saint Fidelis. And so I had never heard of him before. I started to read about him and I was amazed by what he had done with his life. I was really interested by this saint that I had never heard of before. And so if you've never heard of him before either, today is your day to discover this amazing saint, Saint Fidelis, and I hope that you are just as inspired as I was when I first met him. Saint Fidelis was born in 1577, and he was actually given as a baby the name Mark, Mark Ray. And uh, we'll talk a little bit later about why the name change happened, but when he was little, he was known as Mark. And he was born in a place called Sigmaringen, Germany. Uh, his father was the mayor of the town. And so growing up, Mark didn't lack for anything. He lived with his family. They lived a, a rich and a prosperous life. Now, we don't know too much about his early childhood, other than the fact that we know he was raised as a Catholic but he was raised as a Catholic in a country that was being torn apart by religious conflict. You see, 60 years before Mark had been born, a German priest named Martin Luther, who you might have heard of, uh, had began uh, protesting against the Catholic Church. Martin Luther had several disagreements of a theological nature with the church. On several different topics and he had started a rebellion against the Catholic Church starting his own kind of Christianity which was later called the Protestant Reformation this revolution led to all of the different Protestant denominations that separated from the Catholic Church as a result of Martin Luther now as I said, from Luther's original movement, there were various other Protestant leaders that taught something slightly different that continued to splinter off, teaching their own version of Christian theology. And what happened as a result of this is that for several decades, there was religious conflict. There was conflict on theological grounds. There was conflict on political grounds as different rulers uh, felt like their power was being taken away as their population was changing religion. Uh, and sometimes there was actual wars, physical violence between Catholics, between Protestants of all these different denominations. Sometimes Protestants were fighting with each other. It was a very tumultuous time to live in because of this religious conflict that was taking the backdrop of Germany. Now, as a young man, Mark lived in this time and he was raised as a Catholic. And so he would have been uh, interacting with all of these different philosophies and worldviews and theologies growing up. Now, as a young man, Mark went to university, to the University of Freiburg, and he went there to study law because Mark wanted to become a lawyer. And so he went there, he studied law, and while he was there at school, he worked as a tutor for some of the other students who were under him. And while he was their tutor, he would tour with them all over to different places of learning across Europe. And he did this for six years. He mentored different students while he himself was studying law. And the students who were under him were amazed to see just how intense Mark was about his faith. Even while he was on the road with them, he was constantly spending time praying. He was constantly offering up sacrifices and penance to the Lord, and they recognized him to be a very holy man. Throughout his time in university, when the other university students were going out and partying, he never drank and he stayed pure throughout college. He didn't enter into the partying and, uh, the wild life that so often accompanies 
university students. Even back then, that was the culture at universities in many different places. Mark even went an extra mile by taking on additional sacrifices, additional penances in order to have him draw closer to God. What he would do is he would wear something called a hair shirt. And this was a shirt that was made of hair. And so it was very prickly. It was very uncomfortable. And he would wear that underneath his clothing so that he would be able to offer up sacrifices throughout the day to God from wearing this uncomfortable and prickly clothing, while at the same time, people wouldn't know that he was wearing it. He tried to keep that hidden so that they wouldn't think he was holy. So a very humble, a very saintly man, even when he was at university. Wherever Mark went, whenever he had free time, he would visit local churches in every city that he went to, and he would often go to spend hours in prayer before Jesus in the Eucharist. He would find the tabernacle, he would kneel before the tabernacle, and he would get lost in prayer with Jesus, spending hours and hours with his Lord. And so if you didn't know where to find him and you couldn't see him anywhere, your best bet would be to go to the local church because you would probably find Mark praying before the tabernacle. He was also uh, very fond of going to visit hospitals. He would go to spend time with the sick there. Uh, he would comfort those who were lonely, who had been abandoned by their family, by their relatives. He had a really big heart and that came through to everyone. He had a, a real love for people and was very generous with his time. He was also known to be extremely generous towards the poor. Uh, he gave everything that he had away. Sometimes he would give away even his own clothing to beggars, returning home wearing next to nothing. He just had this big heart. He saw someone in need and he couldn't resist giving everything that he had on him, giving away all the contents of his wallet and his friends uh, sometimes had to make fun of him and, and stop him from giving away everything that he owned and becoming a beggar himself because he had such a love for the poor. Now, Mark finished his studies at law school and eventually began to practice law in the country of France. And while he was there practicing law, he earned a nickname for himself. He earned the nickname, the poor man's lawyer. And the reason people called Mark the poor man's lawyer is because he would often use his legal skills to defend poor clients who couldn't afford him at the regular rate. He would defend these poor people that had no other lawyer to turn to, and he would argue their claims for a very reduced price or sometimes even for free. But as he was working in the legal system, as he was interacting with other lawyers, as he was arguing cases in court, uh, Mark began to become extremely disturbed. He was made very uncomfortable when he saw all of the corrupt practices that were commonplace among the lawyers who he worked with. He saw that some of the lawyers were bribing witnesses or they were making side deals outside of the courtroom in order to settle their case. He saw lawyers outright lying in court in order to win. He saw lawyers sabotaging the reputation of their adversaries, using rumors and even using threats in order to discredit their foes in court so that, again, they could win using these dishonest means. Now, Mark, he himself, he scrupulously avoided all of the dishonesty that was rampant in the system. He had uh, a much higher level of virtue. He practiced law as he thought it was supposed to be practiced in a just and fair way, actually trying to reach uh, a good settlement that was fair for all involved. But eventually, he just couldn't take the corruption anymore. He was so disgusted by being surrounded by this atmosphere of cheating and dishonesty that he eventually left his profession as a lawyer. Even though he had spent years in school studying to be a lawyer, he walked away from it all. Now, at the same time, and maybe one of the reasons why he decided to leave the, the law profession was because Mark was beginning to feel this call from the Lord to serve as a priest. He was beginning to experience in his heart a call to the priesthood. His brother George had already become a Capuchin Franciscan friar, 
And so Mark decided that that is where he would try his vocation as well. That's where he would go to discern. And so he joined the Capuchin Franciscans. He became a friar. And when he became a friar, he adopted the new name of Fidelis. And his superior gave him that. It means faithful or uh, having to do with faith. And so his superior noticed the faith that Mark had and gave him the new name, Fidelis. And so after he was ordained a priest, the new Father Fidelis was put in charge of a friary in Fieldkirk in Austria, which is where he traveled and where he served for his first few years as priest. And while he was there, he became very well known by the people for his fiery preaching style. Father Fidelis could really preach a message. He preached with conviction. He preached with passion. He preached in such a way that it, it actually moved people to change their lives. It moved them, rather than just sitting back and listening to a nice homily, after one of Father Fidelis's homilies, they wanted to actually make a response, to give their lives to Jesus, to change their lives and become saints. And so his renown as a preacher began to spread all over the region until a bishop in Switzerland eventually heard about this fiery new priest. He heard about him and he asked him to come on a mission to Switzerland to do a very special mission there, to preach there. Now, the reason that the bishop of Switzerland wanted Father Fidelis to come and preach there is because in Switzerland, Many of the Swiss faithful had left the Catholic Church. They had left the Catholic Church because they had been led astray and become Calvinists. Now, Calvinism, maybe you haven't heard of it before, it's a, a branch of Protestantism that is named after its founder, uh, a French Protestant named John Calvin. And John Calvin had gained quite a following. He had uh, taught his own theology and led many Catholics out of the true church into following his theology of Calvinism. And this was what was happening in Switzerland. Now, John Calvin's theology, uh, it's very complicated. We don't have a whole lot of time to get into all of it today. But some of the theological errors that John Calvin taught his followers in opposition to what the Catholic Church taught was this. Calvinists believed in something called double predestination. Now, that's a fancy term, but uh, it's actually quite easy to understand. Double predestination is this belief that God predestines some people to go to heaven and some people to go to hell, and there's nothing that can change their destination. So God created some people specifically with the intention that they would go to heaven. And then other people God created, and he determined that they would go to hell. And there's nothing that the human person himself can do to impact either way the direction of where he's heading, either heaven or hell. And so as a result of this, Calvinists didn't believe that Jesus died for everyone. Calvinists believed that Jesus only died for those who God had decided ahead of time would be saved. And so you can probably imagine why this is such a problematic teaching. And this goes against what the Catholic Church teaches, that Jesus, in fact, died for everyone. And that God allows people to choose Jesus or to choose their sin and to choose hell. God leaves us free to either embrace him or reject him. And as a result of that, we spend eternity either in heaven or hell. But God doesn't decide ahead of time where we're going. And what we do here on earth matters for where we spend eternity. But Calvinists didn't believe this. And uh, many Catholics were being seduced out of Catholicism and following this false teaching of John Calvin. And the reason many people were believing Calvin's teachings is because their own Catholic priests were either ignorant of how to actually defend church teaching against the Calvinist lies, or they were too lazy and apathetic. These Catholic priests didn't really do anything about it, and they allowed their flock to be stolen away by these eloquent and passionate Calvinists. 
The Calvinist preachers were uh, very smart. They were very emotional. They were very fiery in their preaching style. And so people were being led astray and becoming Calvinists. And so the Bishop of Switzerland asked Father Fidelis to come and preach in order to bring people back to the true church. And so Father Fidelis accepted the challenge. He went to Switzerland for this mission to reconvert the Calvinists who had left the Catholic Church. And all he took with him were his crucifix, his Bible, his breviary, the same prayer that I was mentioning at the beginning of the show that all priests and seminarians pray, and the book of the rule of his order. So his Franciscan order, kind of the rules of life that he was supposed to live, that was all he took. Crucifix, Bible, breviary, and the book of his order. And for the rest, he went in absolute poverty living on the generosity of others, living on what God would provide for him. And so Father Fidelis showed up in Switzerland and he went to work right away. He was preaching in Catholic churches all over the place. He was even preaching in the streets to the crowds, to anyone who would pass by. He had this fire and this zeal to get the message out to as many people as possible. Anyone who would listen to him, he would tell about the love of God and the truth of Catholic teaching about how we are saved. That God hasn't chosen to determine that anyone goes to hell, but that God offers salvation to all of us, and that there are some who will reject him, and some will accept him. Father Fidelis would preach scriptures like 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, that says, God our Savior desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And he would emphasize to the crowds that God truly desires the salvation of all, and it's up to us to make that response. That Jesus desired to save everyone, that he died on behalf of all mankind, offering the free gift of salvation to anyone who puts their faith in him. And he was so articulate and so passionate in his preaching that people flocked from all over to hear him. He was even invited to preach at some Calvinist gatherings. Local Calvinist groups were inspired by his preaching. They invited him to come to their own assemblies to preach. And as a result, many were converted back to being Catholic. Now, of course, Father Fidelis' presence would have made the Calvinist leaders very angry. They saw many of their followers going back to becoming Catholics. And as a result... They hated Fidelis and his work. Father Fidelis was routinely threatened and insulted as he went about his work in Switzerland, but he didn't give up and he didn't back down. In fact, his preaching was so successful that his enemies realized they couldn't defeat him on religious grounds. They couldn't argue with him based on logic. And so they resorted to other measures to get people to stop listening to him. They spread rumors that Fidelis had come to Switzerland not for truly authentic reasons of God, but for political reasons. They lied about him. They said that Father Fidelis had been sent by the rivals of Switzerland in Austria to weaken and divide the Swiss people based on their religion so that they would be even more easily conquered. And so they said that he was a, an Austrian plant who had come in to weaken their country with his religious division. And so as a result, Father Fidelis's mission became even more dangerous. People started to believe this lie that had been spread about him, and he had to travel with an armed guard at all times. Often while he was preaching, he would be shouted down by angry mobs of Calvinists who would yell out death to the Capuchin, wishing death to this Capuchin friar, Father Fidelis. Well, one day, while Father Fidelis was celebrating Mass, he finished the homily, and right after the homily, he went into a state of ecstasy. Those looking at him noticed that he didn't seem to be aware of anything else around him. He was looking up at heaven as if seeing something that no one else could see. And later, he told people that at that moment, God had revealed to him that he would soon be killed for the faith. Now, Father Fidelis wasn't down about this. He was actually very cheerful about this and made jokes about it. He even signed letters after that point 
uh, jokingly at the bottom of the letter, he would sign it as Fidelis, soon to be food for worms, joking that soon he would be buried and soon he would be eaten by worms. Kind of a, a grisly image, but he joked about it. He knew that he would be dying soon because of this prophetic word he received from God. And soon after this, Fidelis was preaching in a Swiss church when a Calvinist mob outside the church began a riot. And they even started to try and break into the church to try and cause a commotion and to get at Father Fidelis while he was preaching. Some of the guards outside the church were killed and a Calvinist actually broke into the church, made his way into the church and fired a musket at Fidelis up at the front and wounded him. Now, one Calvinist who had gone into the church to hear him preach, he actually loved Father Fidelis and was interested in what he had to say. He ran over to Father Fidelis and offered to hide him until it was safe. But Father Fidelis thanked this, this earnest Calvinist who wanted to learn more, but he refused. He said, you know what? My life is in God's hands. I'm going to leave it up to him. And so Fidelis tried to make it outside the church. He tried to leave the town safely, but he was ambushed on the way by a Calvinist minister who came with a team of 20 soldiers. Now, this Calvinist minister called him out. He said, you are a false prophet. And he demanded that Father Fidelis renounce his faith or be killed as a result. And Father Fidelis's response was bold. He said, I was sent here to refute your heresy, not to embrace it. The Catholic religion is the faith of all ages, and I don't fear death. I love that response. Father Fidelis says, I was sent here to convert you, not the other way around. I will never leave the Catholic religion, which God has established for all ages. And so one of them hit him in the head with a club and Father Fidelis fell down on the ground. And even though he was dazed and confused from the blow to the head, he was still able to say, pardon my enemies, O Lord, for blinded by passion, they don't know what they're doing. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, and Mother Mary, help me. One of the soldiers, as he was praying, took his sword and struck Father Fidelis on the head, splitting his skull. And the others surrounded the fallen priest and stabbed him many times until he was dead. They also, as punishment, hacked off one of his legs as a punishment for the many times he had used his legs to travel into their country to preach there. And so St. Fidelis died right there on the road, fearlessly defending the truth that Jesus came to save the whole world. He didn't come to save just a chosen few. He came to save everyone and anyone who put their faith in him. In John chapter 3, verse 16, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, you'll see it at football games. It says this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That is what St. Fidelis taught, that the call to follow Jesus and receive his free gift of salvation is for anyone. It's for you. If you're listening right now and you're hearing maybe for the first time this call to follow Jesus, that is applicable to you. Jesus died for you. And what you do in this world matters as a result of what he did for you. It's not predetermined. God has not determined you for heaven or determined you for hell. He has left it up for you to choose. And if you choose to put your faith in Jesus, to turn away from your sin, to leave it behind, if you choose to become the saint that God is calling you to be, the, the saint that he wants you to be, then that choice is yours and heaven will be open to you. And so let's pray now to St. Fidelis that we would become saints like he did. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Fidelis, you had a love for justice that stopped you from taking advantage of the poor and the mistreated help us to to love justice and to defend the rights of those who have had their rights taken away from them give us the courage like you to be able to preach uncomfortable truths even when 
it causes us to be hated, just like you were hated. And St. Fidelis, you trusted in what the church taught about the universal call to salvation. That Jesus didn't come just for a select few. He came for all those who put their faith in him. So help us to say yes to Jesus so that we can be saved and live forever in heaven with you and with the God who loves us for all eternity. St. Fidelis, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.